Okay, so let's get started. Uh, in today's VQMS, we have Walter Zhang, uh, who'll be presenting this really cool paper that looks at the trade-off between interpretability and uh, optimal targeting. Uh, so as usual, if you have any uh, questions, please put them into the questions box on Zoom, and I will make sure to uh, convey them uh, to Walter during his talk. Um, and I think, uh, Walter, you can get started. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thanks for organizers for having me. So I'm presenting uh, my paper called Optimal Comprehensible Targeting. Uh, the joke I always like to make is that the title is not very comprehensible, but there's really three parts to this paper. The first part is optimal targeting. I'll talk about how we can combine policy learning and deep neural nets to kind of construct a, a better uh, machine learning algorithm to learn the optimal targeting policy. The second part is comprehensible targeting and saying that if I need to make the targeting policy explainable to humans, the regulators, I guess the regulators and customers are all humans. So explainable to humans, uh, how do I construct such a class of targeting policies? And I'll think about the class of targeting policies that are them, themselves sentences. And the last part is that I want to combine comprehensible and also optimal in the sense that I want to find the optimal targeting sentence that is profit maximizing. So we're kind of wrapping up, wrapping these two pieces into one. So with that in mind, I'll motivate the paper with this quote from the president of the EC. Uh, can, can you see the slides okay? The banners are blocking. Okay. And so the algorithms, so what she says is that algorithms must not be a black box and there must be clear rules if something goes wrong. The European Commission will propose a law to this effect next year. And what's been really exciting is that this law was passed a few months ago as the AI Act and will be, full, will be enforced in full in a few years. So this is kind of like a rapidly changing environment and it's kind of cool to kind of see how regulators are, are thinking about how, how they're gonna like regulate and control these different algorithms. However, if we look at how marketing decisions are being made today, a lot of these decisions are dominated by algorithms. So firms like this because these are kind of fast and personalized decision-making, often at the individual level. So you can kind of set marginal revenue versus marginal cost for your marketing mix variables at the individual level. To give you a few examples, we have on uh, Uber Eats, two different sets of restaurants. We'll get promoted to diff two different uh, customers and also the promotions themselves, the amount themselves will also, also be customized or personalized for each individual. Your Netflix homepage will probably be different from the person, uh, I guess, next to you on the video screen. And that's because the uh, Netflix is learning from your past behavior to kind of provide you personalized homepages for you to choose the next movie that you want to watch. And even on the air, in, in the uh, at the airport on the plane, the person sitting in front of you probably paid a very different price for something that's a very similar experience. So that's another way kind of firms are kind of personalizing their prices or the marketing mix using algorithms and doing that at an individual level. So, oops. Uh, so I'll make a qualitative argument why firms need comprehensibility. So going back to the airlines example, think of it the case where an algorithm decides, well, you have an overbooked flight and the algorithm needs to find, figure out who do I kick off the flight. So suppose you, know, you get kicked off and you might want to demand an explanation of the algorithms. You might ask this, the, uh, the representative, hey, why did I get kicked off the airplane? And, and, and more generally, more, a lot of customers have done this where in the sense that they feel slighted by an algorithm decision, they ask the representative and the representative can kind of explain what's going on. So there's a derived demand from customers for these algorithmic decisions to kind of ask what's going on and how do I kind of learn from this decision so I don't get this negative outcome that I had today. And enough, and enough customers have complained such that there's now legislation, this is the AI Act and, GDP, and some element in GDPR, in the sense that there's a right to explanation where customers have this right to kind of get an explanation from this the, the firm or from the person using the algorithms. And another benefit of having comprehensible uh, policies is, is that in a sense it's easy to implement within the firm. It's much easier for a firm's representative to follow the instructions from a sentence or from a decision tree than it is for the person to follow the instructions from a black box or like a deep neural net or a random forest because it's easier to understand and it's easier to implement. So the research question I want to talk about today is how can firms form these comprehensible policies? And this also lets me quantify the economic impact of these rights legislation laws as I can quantify see what is the loss to the firm side as they move away from black box towards something that's much simpler. So to, to kind of guide our construction of the comprehensible policies, we can look at the, the law itself. So here's a, a, a part of GDPR which says that the data subject, in our minds, you can think of this as the customer, will have the right to obtain human intervention so they can have access to a salesperson or to not to a salesperson, to a firm representative, where they can express the customer's point of view 
and the customer is able to obtain an explanation of the algorithm decision reached. And this explanation needs to be given access, giving the customer access uh, to meaningful information about the logic involved. So in a sense, you're as a customer, you're able to ask a person at the firm, a human at the firm, why did I get this decision that the algorithm gave me? And that explanation needs to be meaningful or, be, or give, uh, give access to meaningful information about the logic behind the decision. So in, in my case, if I offer these comprehensible policies, which are themselves kind of one-to-one uh, -to, -one to the targeting policy, then you kind of solve this problem of, I, I guess, to these, you solve this issue of giving people uh, an explanation of the targeting policy because it, it, it itself is, is explained. So the penalties of violating, uh, yeah, you know? Yes, uh, I'm just curious, like, how do you come up with like a formal definition of comprehensible policies? So I noticed like later in your paper, it's like a, a sentence, like as described in your abstract, it's like a sentence or concatenated by a bunch of or clauses, right? So how do you come yeah. up with that definition? Can you provide more like motivation behind that? Yeah, yeah. So I will uh, I'll address that in the next two slides. So this is kind of a perfect segue into that. So so the, so I to address Union's question. Oh, yeah. Mark, do you have a question? Yes, I had a question about the policy. Uh, so this policy doesn't say anything about, does it say anything about the quality of the explanation? Like, should it be an explanation that is helpful? Like what if it's it's a, it's a, it's a deceptive explanation that uh, the algorithm just comes up with to kind of get away with providing some explanation? So it, does the policy say anything about the nature of the explanation? So not explicitly. So in this case, it just needs to provide meaningful information. Uh, depends on how you interpret that. And then there, there's a nice paper by uh, Xavier Lambian at, uh, who who has a who looks at kind of like a game theoretic approach where it's like a firm is offering an explanation to regulators, and then the regulators need to decide whether that's sufficient or not. And they kind of like iterate on on that on that side. So I'm not going to look at that side in my paper, but there's that that's definitely kind of like an open open area of future research, and also definitely. An open area where kind of legal research can also step in a role there. Right. Thank you. Yeah, so, so going back to UN's question, we can now look at how we want to think about comprehension, right? So I need to give you a working definition of comprehensibility for us to kind of construct a comprehensible class of targeting policies. So I'll make this argument that comprehensible effectively means a targeting policy that's transparent in the sense that it's clear to customers, regulators, to firm employees what's going on. So kind of like it's understandable to humans. And it's complete in the sense that that targeting that that tar comprehensible targeting policy is going to be one to one to the actual implemented policy itself. And also, it'd be nice if these targeting policies are conversational, right? So going back to the example where you're kind of asking a sales representative, like, "What's going on? Why did I get this price or why did I get this promotion when someone else didn't?" Then they would just easily like uh, communicate to you exactly what's going. On. So I want something that's transparent and complete, and also conversational. And one class of these is basically the class of sentences. So I have a, if I have a targeting policy that says I target a customer, if she's a new user and has an iPhone, it's very transparent and complete in the sense that you look at the sentence, you exactly know what's going on. And the sentence is the, is the exact targeting policy that's being implemented by the firm. Here, the complexity is going to be proxied by the number of clauses. There are two clauses here. You're, you are a new user and have an iPhone. And then as you add more and more clauses, this targeting policy can, can get more and more complicated. And I'll, I'll just, as a heuristic, I'll just say that it, this is generally conversational up to five clauses. So if you have a sentence that's too long, it's not going to be conversational. Yeah, Omid, you have a question? So based on this, uh, like for example, like if, if the uh, sentence is that you, you see this uh, offer because we use the black box algorithm, mm -hmm. how, how do we see that? Is it based on this definition? Is it, it's, it seems to be transparent. And like, could you walk me through like why it's kind of like it's not a good, comprehensible statement? Yeah. So, so you mean like if I have a black box, why why is kind of like this giving you the black box isn't comprehensible? Is that your question? Yeah. I mean, just I communicate with the user that you're you're seeing it because uh, we use a black box algorithm, and that that's why you're seeing it. Yeah. But the black. So, so in your case, it's like saying that I give you the black box. I say I'm using a black box, and then and then why is it not? effectively comprehensible. I would say like the, because the, the, the relation from the inputs, like your, your covariates, basically your RFM variables in a lot of cases, it's not, it's not, it's not very straightforward to get the decision out of that. So I give you a neural net, you put your variables into the neural net. I can tell you whether you're targeted or not. 
But then if I want to know that, like, why am I targeted? For example, like, for example, if I change my income or change my past behavior, does that change my, the targeting rule? I can't tell you that from the black box directly. So if, if I want to just replace the black box with a simple sentence, if you look at the simple sentence, you look at the model itself, you understand what's going on. And it kind of gives you the mechanism of targeting. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I guess my question is related to on um, this. Then um, in your definition, is tree-based uh, models also part of comprehensible policies? So for example, it can have branches. So if this, then I can have a couple if-else clauses here. And then if that, I can also have a couple of if-else clauses there. Like in total, there may also be still be less than five clauses in total, but then you actually have this decision-making along the way, like a tree branches. Yeah, definitely. So I'll talk about this, I guess, much further down the line. But a lot of the interpretable AI literature actually looks at decision trees and offers them as a nice way to kind of like provide a targeting policy or write like a model for, for decision making. And in my case, when I use a sentence, it's going to be simpler than decision tree. So the decision tree, like you said, is a, if you have all these different paths, right? Each path, if you think about it, is a sentence. So the decision tree itself can be written as many sentences. So in that case, it's going to be more complicated than a simple sentence. And because I want to, yeah, and because I want to make sure these are conversational, right? I want to make sure these are kind of very easy to communicate. It's easier for me to communicate with one sentence than it is for me to give you the whole decision tree. Okay, so in your case, you don't really consider decision trees as comprehensible policies. Well, the, 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 you can think of them as, as comprehensible, but in my case, I want them to be also conversational. So I don't think- it's, Yeah, it does not fall into your class of functions to optimize over, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I only want to think of simple sentences, yeah. So uh, the, the, we are a subset of decision trees. Okay. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, I want to highlight this fundamental trade-off, I guess, that I'm hinting at between short-term profits and comprehensible com comprehensibility of the targeting policy. You can make the x-axis comprehension more mathematically rigorous by saying it's a one over the VC dimension or the rock and complexity of the targeting policy, but for now, just think of it as like, this is how complicated my targeting policy is. So to give you an example, you can think of blanket targeting. This is something that's very high in comprehension, but it's not very profitable because you effectively create one huge segment of customers and give everyone in that segment the same thing. However, blanket targeting is very conversational in the sense that it's very easy to explain what's going on if, if you are using blanket targeting. For example, if I get targeted, I can ask the firm representative, hey, why did I get targeted? They would just say, because you were in my customer base, I just gave everyone in my customer base the same price or the same promotion. So it's very, very easy to communicate and it's very high in comprehension. In contrast, if we think about the class of black box models, which, which I will denote by this blue curve, it's not going to be conversational, but it's going to be more profit maximizing than, let's say, blanket targeting. And the way to think about this curve is that something on the right-hand side of this curve, uh, uh, this point, you can see my cursor, is going to be something that's a black box or a neural net with like a few layers or a few, uh, few nodes or a forest with a few trees, something that's very lower, uh, that has fewer parameters. And then as you add more and more parameters, you're going to get better performance up to a certain point, and then you start overfitting. So something on the left-hand side is something with, that's kind of overfit, and something on the right-hand side is kind of have, has a, it's a black box with a few parameters. In my case, I want to think about the class of black boxes that are neural nets because they have nice properties in the sense they can kind of approximate any function if you give it enough data. And then I also want to think about how can we construct the optimal black box starting policy. And to that approach, I'll combine policy learning and deep neural nets in a static setting and give you and give you theoretical guarantees around its performance. So in, my, in the application, this is going to be the black box that, that yields the highest profits. And I'll call this the optimal black box problem, uh, policy because this is a targeting policy that's a black box and it's going to give me the profit maximizing targeting policy. Now we can also look at the class of comprehensible policies. So these are the class of senses that I mentioned before. And you could think of something like, I target a customer if she lives in Philadelphia. This is going to be more complicated than blanket targeting because now I've constructed two class, two segments of my customers, people who live in Philly and people who don't live in Philly. And I can make this sentence more complicated by adding more clauses. So I can target you if you live in Philly and you've recently bought. Now I've cre basically created three segments and I'm targeting the people who, who live in Philly and who have bought recently. And as I kind of optimize over this class of sentences, you can find the one that's going to be profit maximizing. This is... I'm going to term the optimal comprehensible policy because it's the optimal sentence that's, that's profit maximizing. And then I can compare the two between the optimal comprehensible policy and also the optimal black box in the sense that I could look, how do they differ in their targeting policies? Who gets targeted when the other one doesn't? And all I can also look at the profits generated from the two. So this is kind of putting these two differences in economic terms. 
I can look at the profit generated from the black box, the profit generated from the comprehensive targeting policy, and then ask, does it matter? And what is the cost of explanation? In a sense, the profit loss going from an optimal black box to an optimal comprehensive policy. Yeah, all of it. Yeah, maybe this is just a, a heuristic point, but uh, is this implying that you basically, that there is overfitting in the class of comprehensible policies that at a certain point, uh, I'm making smaller segments, but they're also less profitable? Yeah, so this is very stylistic, but you can right. think of it as like, if I have a comprehensible policy with, it's like, I have a sentence, right, with let's say 5,000 clauses, I can kind of think, I can kind of see how that could overfit in practice. Okay, but generally, should we think that there is that the direction over the support of like sentences you're looking at that the longer the sentence, the better the profit? Yes, well, up to a certain point. So in the yeah. when I show you the plot where it's like the, the profits on the y-axis and the x-axis is, is the sentence length, it basically goes up and it kind of flattens out. Sure. But I but I can see how eventually, like if you give it like too many clauses, you can start going down. But basically, okay. you can think of these as flat instead of sloping down. Too. Yeah, am I? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, and you can skip this if you're going to show it in the next few slides. Uh, when you look, when you think of this delta, are you thinking of it as operating through the accuracy of the underlying model, or are you going to think of other mechanisms through which uh, the profit could be reduced because of having a more comprehensible policy? It's going to be the just yeah. okay. It's because I kind of tie my hands in how complicated the model can be. It can only be so accurate, and that's going to drive this gap in profits. Okay, okay. So there's no uh, in, in your kind of setup. There's no way for a more interpretable targeting policy to somehow improve profits by improving decision making directly. So you can kind of no. maybe you can see that. I think in, there's, there's some literature on the CV side that looks at how people value something that's more understandable. And but but for now, I, I, I don't look at that because I don't have data to answer that question. So I kind of said that said that benefit of comprehension to zero in my case. Thank you. OK, so to, to recap, I have this framework where I have an optimal black box policy. I have an optimal comprehensible policy and an optimal sentence. And then I want to compare the two uh, differences and kind of see whether that that gap is big and, and this gap represents the kind of the, the economic impact of these rightful execution laws. Because as you move away from black box, you sort of something simpler, you're gonna lose some profits and this profit and this cost of explanation will, will kind of define that gap. Okay, so for the first part, I'll talk about policy learning with deep neural nets. I'll give you kind of an overview of how we wanna think about this approach. Yeah, you got Sorry, just another clarification question. In your comprehensible policy, in your sentence, do you only allow and, or do you also allow or? Yeah, yeah, so I'll talk about how we generate these, but I allow for or and also the exclusive or. Exclusive or, so can you have more than two ors in your sentence? Yeah, you can have more than two ors. You can also have more than, like you can have or, you can have any combination of and and ors or exclusive ors. Got it. In that case, actually a tree-based structure may actually fall under your comprehensible policy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in the paper, I, I show that you can map the sentence to a tree. So a mm -hmm. sentence with two clauses can always be represented by a tree with, with two layers. But a tree with two layers cannot always be represented by a sentence with, with two clauses. So the tree is more complicated than the sentence. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that, that is the right intuition I, that, that I want people to think about. Okay, so this part, I'll talk about how we can combine policy learning with deep neural nets and give you uh, theoretical guarantees around its performance. And I'll argue that this is going to be the optimal black box policy, at least, and I'll show it in my application. So the standard approach to finding an optimal policy function in the literature is you first run a randomized control trial, and then you estimate the uh, distribution of heterogeneous streaming effects using some machine learning method. This could be causal force, the, a causal deep net, or a lasso. But then once you've estimated this distribution of heterogeneous streaming effects in your population, then you plug it into the optimal treatment rule, which basically says, as long as my marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost, of issuing you individually this, this uh, targeting or this kind of like the, the promotion of the market mix variable, then I should target you. So in a sense, you wanna target people where the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost. And you wanna do this at the individual level. What I'm gonna argue is that I'm gonna say that I'm gonna get rid of the second step. And I just wanna learn the optimal targeting policy, this, this D uh, star function directly from the data itself. 
And the way I'll do this is that I'll build upon the statistical uh, literature using statistical surrogates for the policy function. And in the back end, I'm basically smoothing out the, uh, the optimal targeting policy and learning that directly from the data. And this also builds upon the policy learning literature in, in the CS and, econo and econometrics literatures. So to give you an intuition of why this works, let's think about, uh, let's go back to this case where we think about the distribution of the continuous out of effects with the heterogeneous treatment effects. So suppose I estimate, I first have this density, which represents the distribution of heterogeneous treatment effects in my population. I have this cutoff rule, which is this vertical line. And the optimal targeting rule is basically saying that if, you're, if, you're just, if your heterogeneous treatment effect is to the right of this vertical line, I should target you. And if your heterogeneous treatment effect is to the left of it, I shouldn't target you. But if I put Olivia's heterogeneous treatment effect estimate as this black dot, and I estimate her a little bit higher or a little bit lower, the key idea is that because it doesn't cross this vertical line, it doesn't change whether I should target Olivia or not. So the idea that I want to emphasize for this part is that instead of learning this density and then figuring out whether you're above or below this line, you should just directly learn whether Olivia's heterogeneous treatment effect is just above or below this line. So the, power, so the gain here is that you're turning a density learning problem into a classification problem, and this is going to give you a lot more efficiency, which in practical terms means that you can learn faster using or with less data. Okay, so in my case, I'll use a deep neural net to represent the policy function, which basically uh, allows you to input the variables for the individual. This goes through some a deep neural net, and then this goes into the policy function, which combines with the outcome variable and also the treatment indicator to give you the loss, which is this profits. So the idea here is that I want to minimize or maximize profits or minimize negative profits directly to learn the policy function. And in the paper, I have some theoretical results, but I think given the length of the talk, I'll just skim over them. But you can get analytical standard errors around the profits learned from this, this approach when you represent it with the deep net. And I also have a proof in the paper, but I kind of just hand wave over this for now. If people are interested, I'm happy to talk about this later. So the key idea with this policy deep neural net is that you're using a deep neural net to represent the policy function, which is a map of the people's individual characteristics to whether they get the promotion or not. And using this approach is going to be, you're going to directly learn who to target instead of learning the density and then figuring out who to target. And because you're using a classification problem instead of the density learning problem, this is going to be easier to learn than learning the heterogeneous treatment effects distribution. And then the theory that, that, that's in the paper will give you standard errors around the expected profits. So you can get analytical standard errors instead of kind of running things like a bootstrap to kind of figure out what is the uncertainty around the target pulse. So then for the second part of the paper, I'll talk about how can we construct class of comprehensible policies. So this is constructing the class of sentences that kind of you and mentioned before in the introduction. So the class of comprehensible policies, in my case, remember, I define these as transparent and complete. And they fall into this general framework where I apply a marketing decision D. You can think of this as choosing a promotion or setting a price if a customer has this and that where this and that are two clauses generated from your data, and and is a logical operator that kind of joins these two clauses together. So to give you a more concrete example, I could target a customer with a promotion or with an email if she uses the VQMS website or has spent in the last 30 days, right? So these are two characteristics. You use the website or you have spent in the last 30 days, and the logic operator that kind of joins these two clauses together will be over. And more generally, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you from using exclusive or two. So you can just search over the space where it's and or exclusive or to find kind of these sentences. Here, I'm going to say complexity is basically captured by the number of clauses. So a sentence with 20 clauses will be a lot more complex than a sentence with two clauses or one clause. And these clauses that I'll, that I'll discuss later in a few slides is that you're going to just generate these different clauses from the standard recency frequency and monitor data uh, for, for like a standard database marketing setup. And this is going to be different from the triple AI literature. This is the, so there they're going to often give you a decision tree or a kind of a dictionary of di a different uh, decision rules. And you as the user have to look up exactly from the dictionary why you were targeted. In my case, I'm giving you something simpler than that. I'm just giving you a sentence. And it's very easy for you to understand exactly why, why you got targeted because it's, it's just following this simple sentence. Yeah, Omid, do you have a question? Uh, just, just a very simple question. Uh, can we define some variable that is interaction of like 10 variables here? Yeah, so, so, pause. yeah so, so in my case, I, I don't allow for that, right? So if you think about it at extreme case, I can give my data set to a data scientist 
The data scientist can estimate the heterogeneous human effects. Let's say like the data scientist McKinsey, the McKinsey can give them back to me. And I can argue that I'm targeting people if their heterogeneous treatment effect is greater than the cost of targeting. But, but McKinsey effectively is doing all the work for me. He's converting the data into the heterogeneous treatment effects. And I'm just kind of targeting people when, who McKinsey says is profitable. So in my case, I don't allow for that because now the map between the, the X variables that you have, the covariates, into the targeting policy is not clear. And, it's, and I just want to make, make sure that mapping is clear. And I do that with these sentences instead of using like a black box or in, or in that case, using a data science or, or McKinsey to tell me who's profiting. Okay, you and do you have a question? The raised hand for, okay. Okay, so the recap, I'm gonna construct these class of sent targeting sentences. And these sentences will be a little bit simpler than what's being used in Turbo AI literature, which is often like a, like a dictionary of decision rules or a decision tree, because in this case, a sentence is just one path down the decision tree. It's going to be a little bit simple. Okay, so let's talk about how we generate these things from the data itself. So let's say I have some recon recency frequency monetary data. This is your standard RFM data. I have the customer ID over here. I have whether you're a new user right now, also the phone type that you have, and also the past sales you spent on the platform. So I have discrete variables and a can use variable for, for the customers. And I'll talk about how can we construct the clauses from this. So for discrete variables or for binary variables, it's very easy, right? If you're a new user, then the clause for, that describes that is just whether you're a new user or not. For categorical variables, you just cut them up into these discrete variables. Kind of, uh, so, so for example, like for the phone, you can just say you have an iPhone, you have an Android, or you, you don't have a flip phone. And then for continuous variables, you have to discretize these into these different clauses. And I'll talk about how we can do this on the next slide. So to give an example, let's, here's the distribution of past November sales in my empirical application. So the first observation I think we all see is that 97% or most of it, basically everyone is zero. So most people don't spend uh, in this case, at least in, in this setting. So the first clause I want to make is that you have zero past November sales. So whether you're in this bin or not as zero. So then let's look at the distribution conditional that you are non-zero or that you do spend in, in November. And then you see this uh, density over here. So then I want to cut this up by saying that if you're above the 50% uh, or above, if you're above the medium, then you have high past November sales. If you're below this medium line, then you have low past November sales. And these are just two additional clauses generated uh, by cutting off these continuous variables. So to recap, if we have these continuous variables, we can, we're going to cut them up into saying whether you're zero, whether you're low, additionally, you're not zero and whether you're high conditional that you do spend. So we have binary variables that are just clauses themselves. We don't need to do more work there. Categorical variables can just be split up into these into the, into the uh, binary variables and then made into clauses. And for continuous variables, we just cut them up. So they're zero, low conditional that you're not zero, and high conditional that you're not zero. So we're cutting them up to three pieces. And you can then join them using logic operators. So if I have two clauses like A and B, I can do A and B. A or B, A exclusive or B. And you can also add the not operator. So you can do not A and B and so on. So this way, even though you're very simple, there's actually a lot of different combinations you can do with these clauses. So to recap, comprehensibility uh, so far means that we're transparent and we're complete in the sense that the sentences are easier to understand to humans. And also they're, they are complete in the sense that they're one-to-one -to, -one to the targeting policy that's been implemented. And to give you an example of these comprehensible policies out there, if you ever open a website and you see this little promotion, you can think of it as the company using targeting, using the, the policy target a customer as she uses the website and has not bought before on the platform. So now let's talk about how do we find the optimal comprehensible policy. So what we've done now is we traced out this red curve by constructing the class of sentences that are themselves targeting policies. And now we want to find the one that optimizes profits. So to do that, we first need to construct a profit estimator. So this is the standard inverse propensity weighted estimator, which tells me, and you can just think of this as this is the amount of expected pro or the an estimate of the profits from from giving it a different targeting policy. And you can use this for let's say a randomized control trial. And let me just give you the intuition of why this works. And the idea is that if I have a case where I want to evaluate the targeting strategy for let's say this population where I want to target everyone on the top the upper top right, and I don't want to target people in the bottom left. Yet I have a randomized control trial where I randomize who gets 
uh, which promotion. So here it's not clear exactly because it's randomized uh, who's getting, like who's targeted and who's not targeted. Then you can scale up the people where the, the proposed targeting strategy and a randomized targeting rule overlap, like this one over here, uh, to account for the fact that sometimes these two will not align. So this is kind of using the inverse propensity weighted estimator to kind of scale up these, these points where the people overlap. And this effectively lets, lets you evaluate any proposed targeting strategy on a randomized control trial or randomized targeting policy. So this idea uh, at a high level, it says that I can have an estimate of profits for any targeting policy that I put into this function. So then if I can do this, then why not just optimize these sentences by optimizing profits directly? So I have an estimate for profits. This D term is the targeting policy, which is the class of sentences or the sentences. And then I'm basically maximizing over the different sentences to find the highest profits. So the sentence that finds the highest profits that's still comprehensible, that's still comprehensible will then be the optimal comprehensible policy. And because these sentences are very simple, you can just get standard errors using the empirical process bootstrap. So you can just boot, basically bootstrap these sentences to get the uh, to get standard, credible standard errors around the performance. Okay. So to learn these sentences, I'll use a greedy algorithm that learns these sentences left to right, like you learn a decision tree top to bottom. So you first have a sentence with one clause. So let's say I target a customer if she is A or if she has an iPhone. I first find this best one clause sentence. Then I freeze that clause, I hold that first part fixed. I find the, the logic operator, the joiner in the second clause. So for example, like a targeted customer, she has an iPhone and she lives in Philly. So that'd be the second part. Then I hold that fixed, the first two parts fixed, and then I find the third part. So using a greedy algorithm allows me to kind of learn this in uh, very quickly, but you are trading off the fact that you might be hitting a local optima instead of global optima. Just like when you learn addition tree, you're front of learning like a, like a heuristic tree, I guess, instead of the global reality tree. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you again? Yeah, I just want to clarify my understanding here. If you adopt a greedy algorithm here, then that means, say, if I want to have a different targeting rule for, say, female customers versus male customers, then likely you will miss those kind of rules, right? Because you, you have to jointly optimize them. You cannot do like a sequential greedy optimization in order to find different targeting rules for different subpopulations. Yeah, so you can first make the split, right? You can first split saying, I, I want to have, you can freeze the first clause, let's say in your case by gender, mm -hmm. and then you can learn the clauses after that, right? So, so you can still kind of enforce that by kind of setting this to be what you want. Right, but say my targeting rule is for females I target who are above a certain age, and for male I target who are below a certain age. Mm -hmm. Then it has to be, a joint of two clauses, which have two clauses together. Like, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I think if you're asking, can I learn all the interactions between two clauses with this? And the answer is no, right? Because you're only optimizing these left to right. But in practice, if you have priors about what what you want to optimize over, let's say gender and then age, you can force the first part to only search over gender, and then the second part to only search over age. Right, but you can't learn the optimal interaction term from A and B directly using this greedy approach. Right, um, I may follow up offline, but thanks. Yeah, yeah sure, thanks. Yeah, Ahmad? I have a question and there's a related question from the audience. So step two, uh, you're splitting based on what split gets you the maximum profit, maximizes your profit. Yes. Uh, in, uh, and I'm kind of relating this to decision trees where you want a decision tree that's accurate, but you don't actually split on accuracy. You split on minimizing, uh, info maximizing information gain. And the reason is that you can actually show that if you split on accuracy, you don't maximize accuracy. So I'm trying to apply that logic over here. Do you know that splitting on, based on profit maximization actually leads to a profit maximizing set of rules uh, in the sense that uh, uh, does it like in, every time you split, does it increase? Is there a gain in your profit at every splitting step? Yeah. So in this case, I think it's mechanical, right? Because at every step you, you want to maximize profits. So you're choosing the one that maximizes profits. I think maybe there, there might be an argument to also answer you guys' question. Like if I split on something like entropy, is that yeah. going to allow me to capture higher order dependence across clauses? And I haven't looked at that. So maybe like future research or like some something down the line could look at that. 
Right, right. And uh, I'm just reading out a question from the audience by Matt or Josh Uh So do you use regret here? And what is the marginal change in the payoff as you add each dummy variable? Uh, okay. And if the regret is zero uh, for any marginal bit, do you just terminate? Yeah, so, okay, so so there's two questions here. The first question is, is it regret? And here it's not. Here's, well, you can think of it as regret, but here it's basically just an estimate of the profits I have, and I'm just maximizing profits. Naturally, you can turn this into regrets. For example, there's a theoretical upper bound of profits, and I'm minimizing the gap between this, this profit estimator and also the theoretical upper bound. So you can turn this profit maximization into minimize, like a regret minimization. So those two are kind of one-to-one -one in this example. The second part is that how do you choose the number of clauses or whether you know an, an incremental clause or an incremental dummy variable in this language will, will make the profits not, not increase by that much? That's an empirical question. And I'll actually show you that plot later down the line for the application. And but the, in my case, I'm just I'm going to set the number of clauses ex ante. So I'm going to say I want to find the best three clause sentence or the best two clause sentence, and I'll do this machinery to kind of find the that sentence for you. But I guess more. Down the line, the firm can kind of use those heuristics and kind of choose how how long of sentence do I want to learn and what is the stopping policy, I guess, for the sentence itself. But yeah, but I'll go back to this uh, with the application and then feel free to jump in if I didn't answer your question. Thank you. Okay, so going back, I'll use a greedy algorithm to learn these sentences. And then we want to effectively learn the sentence by maximizing profits. And to give you another example of a comprehensive policy you can think of is that if you see these ads, let's say with Apple, you can think of them as you target a customer if she's on a competitor's plan and is on the website. Okay, so the framework so far that we constructed is that we have an optimal black box policy, this point over here, and also an optimal comprehensive policy, which is on the right, which is the max of the red curve. And now we want to compare the two, I guess, with an application in mind to kind of make these numbers more salient. So I'm going to use uh, Circuit City, or you can think of Best Buy. So I'm going to think of an application where the setting is kind of an electronic store that's selling durable goods. And I'll use the IMSI durable goods data. So this is publicly available data on the Martin Science website. And here we have a randomized control trial where they, where they kind of gave $10 off price promotions to half the population randomly and then held the other side group, uh, didn't give it to the other half of the people as a control group. So we have a randomized control trial experiment where the thing being, that's being implemented is a $10 off price promotion. So we have around 177,000 customers with 100 free treatment RFM or recency frequency and monetary covariates. And the setting, like I said before, is a durable goods store, mainly electronics in the US. Here, the treatment is going to be randomly assigned. So half the people will get a $10 off price promotion that's physically mailed to them, and the other half will be the control group. And the outcome variable that we care about is going to be the sales during December 2003. So you can think of these uh, treatments being mailed out during Thanksgiving, which is in late November, and we want to see the effect of these promotions on December of 2003, so the next month. So mailed out last week of November, what is the effect in December? And we want to find the optimal policy to kind of maximize the profits for the next month. If we just figure out what the average treatment effect of the experiment, we find that it's positive and significant. It's going to be around $2.68. And for the purpose of this, uh, for this application, I'll assume the profit margin is 45%. The items and also the cost of mailings is the cost of sending out an envelope in 2003, which is just 37 cents. Okay, so let's first look at the how the black the black boxes perform. Uh, so here I've given you some benchmarks. So here are all the out of sample individual expected profits. If you follow the targeting policy that's generated from these different black box or different po targeting policies. So the first one is going to be the policy deep neural net. This is this thing I, I mentioned before. Find policy learning with deep neural nets directly. And you want to directly learn the targeting policy from the data. The next two benchmarks represent the case where you first learn the distribution of heterogeneous treatment effects, and then you plug it into the optimal targeting policy, which then thresholds this beta distribution, the heterogeneous treatment effect distribution, into the people we want to target and people we don't want to target. And you can represent this distribution either using a causal forest or a lasso. So the causal forest is going to be non, it's going to be more heterogeneous or more non-parametric, and then the lasso kind of enforces kind of this linear functional form on this heterogeneous stream effects. And lastly, a nice benchmark to have is this blanket targeting. So this is the amount of profits you generate from doing no personalization if you just gave everyone the same price promotion in the block, in, I guess, in, in the experiment. So the first thing to note is that going from the blanket targeting to the lasso is pretty substantial. There seems to be some gains of, or some gains, I guess, to doing any personalization. But this, this gap is as, as big as going from the causal forest to the positive deep neural net. So it seems like 
there is some value added to just learning the policy directly from the data instead of kind of just going from uh, learning the heterogeneous streaming effects then just kind of setting up the policy. I guess that's, uh, uh, yeah. So, so here the, the takeaway is that if you can directly learn the policy from the data and one way to do it is using the policy deep neural net, which is what I provided you before. So now we can look at the optimal comprehensible policy. So this is the sentence that I learned from maximizing profits using that greedy algorithm that I mentioned before. So if we look at the sentence, it basically says that I target a customer if she's bought a high amount of items. Remember high is in the top 50% conditional that you do spend. Uh, so you target a customer if she's bought a high amount of items during Christmas for the last two years and did not have high spending during spring over the last two years or has low spending during last year's holiday mailer promotional period. So the way to think about this, if you rationalize this ex post, is that the first two clauses, these describe individuals who buy a lot during Christmas and incur their spending during spring. So you want to target people with a $10 promotion in December if, if they're really loading up during December, maybe for holiday gifts. And the second group of people are people who are on the RFM data set. So they've been a customer in the past, but they didn't spend last year during Christmas. So maybe these are customers who kind of went to a different company or kind of churned, and then you want to retarget them with a lot of press promotion to be like, hey, I'm still here. Here's $10 off. I'm spending my company. So this kind of, this sentence basically describes two sets of customers, people who buy a lot during Christmas and people who've kind of forgot about the store last year, but are still on your RFN uh, data set. So now I can look at how the two different targeting policies differ from the black box. There's the star DNN and also the comprehensive policy, which is the sentence that I showed before. So to make things simple, let's look at the two clause comprehensive policy, which is saying that I target a customer if she buys a lot during Christmas for the last two years and did not have high spring spending over the last two years. So to visualize this, I've just plotted the raw data. These are all individuals in my data set by the items they buy during Christmas and also the spring sales. The first thing I'll do is that I'll plot the individuals who the deep net will target. These are these green dots, uh, these, these green triangles, I guess. And any point where the green dot and also the, the gray dot overlap is someone that the deep net will target in the population. So the takeaway from this thing is that it's not very clear what the deep net is doing. Uh, at least to me, maybe someone else can tell me exactly what the deep net is doing. But if you look at something like this comprehensible targeting policy, which is going to target everyone who have who has below $200 in spring sales and also who buys two or more items on Christmas, which is just this pink rectangle, it's very clear what the uh, targeting policy is doing. And, it, and it, like from the more managerial side, it's much easier to implement kind of this targeting policy. That's the, the simple sentence than it is to do this deep neural net, which is not very clear in how it's forming these targeting decisions. Okay, so then we can also look at the cost of explanation, which is the gap in profits between the deep neural net and also the comprehensive policy. So this is going to be the uh, figure that I mentioned before that's going to compare the number of clauses, the sentence length, going from a targeting policy with one clause all the way to targeting policy with 10 clauses. The Y variable is going to be the individual objective profits generated from this targeting policy. And this red line is going to be the policy deep neural net. So this is going to be the like upper bound of the of the profits if I don't care about oh, like the if I don't use the sentences, I just use the best black box that I care about or that, that I can use. And here you can see from this uh, green line, as you add more and more clauses, you get better performance up to a certain level. And then after uh, around a sentence with five clauses, it kind of flattens out all the way to 10 clauses. So the, there's two takeaways from here. The first one is that if you use a three clause targeting policy that's over here, it gets you 92.7% of the way to the black box. So you get very close to a black box and the fact that the two are not uh, significantly different after three clauses. The second part is that it's gonna be more subtle is that if you go back all the way here to the causal forest, this does $2.74 out of sample. So then if you go back here, it looks like the, it's, over, it's me over here. So it looks like even if you do policy learning with a simple sentence, that's gonna be outperforming the causal forest in this case. So it seems like even though there's a lot to gain, I guess in this case, by doing policy learning instead of the standard approach where you estimate the heterogeneous respect and then kind of learn the output target policy. Yeah, you, you have a question? Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> I wanted to clarify. So for the policy DNN, Usually, like you have like a decision threshold there, right? So if it's above that threshold, then you target them. Otherwise, you don't. Then yes. I guess the performance of your policy DNN, like should that be a function of this decision decision threshold, or how is that like picked in your example here? Yeah. So so for the so for the policy DNN, the decision threshold is set ex ante. 
And then you, as it's like, learned, how is that set? Like, is that done through validation or? No, so, so you just choose it at, at a third level. So, so in my case, I just choose it at 0 0.5. And then when you learn the, like, when you learn the, I guess the policy itself, it's going to learn a smooth function of that indicator function before. So if that value that it learns is going to be above 0 0.5, then they should be targeted. And if it's below, then they shouldn't be targeted. So the idea is that you kind of, you want to replace that indicator function of marginal cost greater than marginal, or marginal revenue greater than marginal cost with a smooth function. And then you want to learn the smooth function to threshold it. And then, and then that's going to be the targeting policy. Yeah, my point being that then the performance of the policy DNN should actually depend on what exactly threshold you choose, if my understanding is correct. Yeah, right? so, so you, but you choose it ex ante, right? So if you choose it at a higher threshold, it can learn around that threshold as well. Right, it actually depends on like how many population you want to target in, in, in the end. Like that threshold can be chosen based on that. Is that correct? So all I'm saying is that this right curve to me sounds like maybe you can actually also make it fluctuate as a function of the hyperparameter you chose, which is like at that threshold that you picked. So, so here, so, so here, like the the threshold won't affect the learning because if I choose a higher threshold, like say zero point seven instead of zero point five, when you learn the optimal policy with the gradient updating, right, it's going to push everyone who should be targeted above zero point seven. Maybe this is something we can chat about offline, I, I guess, because it because it's like we can also set it to something lower. And then the gradient updates will just push it above that value. But yeah, maybe let's try to outline about exactly how you want to implement this. Right, because that will change the training data of your policy DNN and will potentially change the, the final profits as well. Yeah, I'm just curious why this that right, uh, straight line versus the issue actually depend on the hyperparameter you choose. Yeah, so here, here because it's just the, I'm just varying the number of centimeters. Yeah, 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 I know. Because, but, but if the x-axis is actually the threshold, then probably you'll also see some variation. But yeah, but thanks yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah, Omid, do you have a question? Have you considered other uh, comprehensible or close to comprehensible policies here? Like, for example, like I could think of like policy tree by ATN Bogger could be a good alternative to benchmark here or like something like when you have the classification task, you can run it under logistic regression and see mm -hmm. like what are some of the main parameters that matter. The things that are kind of more interpretable for us maybe like they don't fit in fully in your comprehensible framework, but do we have results on that? That's no, actually, so that's a good point. So I'm running that right now. So so my, my intuition for policy tree, because it, it learns, it's a two-step approach, right? It learns the, the cage directly using the causal forest and then it learns to treat additional on the cage. I think it, it's going to do worse than the causal forest. In, in, in my case, you can replace the, the simple sentence with this decision tree that maximizes profits. And that probably will give you something between, let's say the green, this green line and also the red line here. And then other cases where you kind of use explainable AI to kind of like look down at what are the variables that matter and then use that to kind of generate something that's more like a like a sentence or like a more interpretable tree. I, I have no idea where that's gonna how that's gonna perform. So I'm still running those and hopefully I can answer that question in, in the next iteration. And then another question here. So this 92.7 percent, I just want to kind of like get a good perspective of this. So here, if we go with the blanket policy, I think we will get like 86% of the performance of the policy. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think it's like around, so the blanket policy is around 2.4 watt. Right? Right. So it's 50% of the gain, basically, like yeah. from blanket to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and then I'll, I'll mention these numbers in two slides, but yes, exactly. That's, that's the, so, so there's, so in this case, blanket will give you like around like over here, and then, but there's some gain to doing the direct approach. And then, of course, in the black box would be better than the direct, like the sentence approach. Yeah, Amad? Yeah, I'm just going to ask a few questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, first one is, uh, what is the meaning of standard errors uh, of each model? Uh, are these sample variances? Uh, and the DNN had a higher variance, right? So is, is that a... Is oh. that a yeah, yeah, so that's a good point. So so if we go back to the standard errors, this is the standard errors around the individual profits, right? So the idea is that the, the deep neural net will generate $3.02 on average, and then the standard error or the uncertainty around this estimate is around $0.24 cents per person. And the second point is that uh, someone asked, why is this, let's say for the causal forest and then for the lasso, why are these numbers lower than for the, the deep net, right? And this is the reason why I add the, added these crosses, is that if you think about it, so for, for the causal forest and the lasso, there's no way to get analytical standard errors around, let's say, the individual profits, because you can, with causal forest, you get something around the heterogeneous streaming effects, 
And because you're putting these heterogeneous stream effects through an indicator function, you can't use the delta method to kind of get these standard errors for, for these uh, for the expected profits. So in, in that case, I hold the causal force model fixed, and then I just bootstrap the the, the targeting policy and let's say in the out of sample data set to get these to get these estimates of standard errors. So this one only accounts for the standard error in the in the targeting policy because it's holding the model fixed. This one is gonna incorporate the uncertainty for the model and also the uncertainty in implementation in the in the uh, out of sample data set. So this one's accounting for more uncertainty than these other two. I think my sense is that if you allow for model uncertainty for this one, along with the, the uncertainty in the implementation, then these numbers have to be higher. Because this one I argue from the theoretical side is going to be more efficient. Right. Or you could also do the bootstrapping for policy DNN. Yeah, yeah. So I can also hold the model fix and then bootstrap and then just show these things for the for the out for the I guess the validation set and this one should be lower. My right. interest. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, so let's go back here. So here, what I've shown you is that here are the profits between for the optimal black box, which is the policy deep neural net, and also the optimal comprehensible policy. And then if we look at uh, the results out of sample, so this is the comprehensible policy generates two dollars and eighty cents per person. This is the targeting policy that is the sentence on the right hand side, and the black box will generate three dollars and two cents. And this difference is going to, or the cost of explanation is going to be twenty two cents per person. So the way to think about this is that as the firm moves away from the black box. Or it's something that's comprehensible, it's going to lose 22, per, 22 uh, cents per person in expectation uh, because it's no longer able to use the black box. It's a target box. So to recap, this loss moving away from the black box is 22 cents per person. This represents a 7% loss of the black box uh, profits, and it also represents a 15% gain over blanket targeting. So there's some gain over no personalization, but it's going to lose money, of course, to the full black box procedure. And the targeting policy that I've learned from data itself is just over here, which is nicely represented in a simple sentence. Okay, so I have time for a quick discussion point. So we can now think about, we can now quantify effectively what is the economic impact of this right to explanation legislation for firms as they move away from the black box to return to as comprehensive, right? So we now need to compare the profits or the welfare for the firm for a black box policy and also a comprehensible policy. This is the decision that the firm will make. So you can think of this as, if I use a black box policy, I'll learn, I'll get some profits from using a very complicated target policy, but I also might face a regulatory penalty if the regulator catches me from using this black box. On the flip side, if I have a comprehensible policy, I'll get something that's lower in profits because I'm using a simple sentence instead of using a black box. And there could be some long-term benefits of comprehension, maybe for my customers, might build broader and broader, a better brand equity, I guess, down the line. So in my case, I'm going to set this long-term effects of comprehension to be zero. And I'll just effectively look at the trade-off between staying with the black box, getting some more profits, but facing a right to penalty in, in expectation versus kind of uh, making less money using the comprehensive target policy. So we can kind of think about the question, does the firm stay with the black box or move away towards the comprehensible policy? Yeah, Matt? Yeah, this question is related to this. So if since there is no... Nothing in the policy tells me anything about the quality of my explanation. So as a firm, wouldn't I just use policy DNN and then apply some post hoc explanation tool to the policy DNN model and then just use that as my explanation, which is probably yeah. going to be low quality, but like, you know, who, who really cares about that? Yeah, so so in this case, I'm, I'm requiring the explanation to be one to one to the targeting policy that's being implemented. So in, in your case, if I take the like, okay. let's say I have like a black box and I use explainable AI to kind of generate some local explanation, the local yeah. explanation will be, will be just for you, not it won't be for like Olivia. So so right. it's not generally learnable, I guess, for most people. Yeah, right. but you use a global explanation method, or you could aggregate a bunch of local explanations. Yeah, so, so you, you can do that, right? So you can take a black box and then project it down to a, to something that's explainable. And then I have a section in the paper where I show that if you do that two step that two step approach of learning a black box and then projecting it down to something simpler, that's always going to do worse than learning this, the the simpler thing to maximize profits in one step. And the idea is that if you can do things in one step, you should just do it in one step instead of taking two two steps to do it. I think uh, Omid and you have. Yeah. So I, I think uh, following up on uh, Emma's question, uh, just uh, it, you could actually kind of like frame it as a as a way as a, as a framework for algorithmic auditing. Like the 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 way you are kind of like describing this with with a clear definition of comprehensibility, I think it has this sort of like 
scope. And I think it's a very interesting thing here. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. But yeah, I should definitely look into that. I think I think that requires me to kind of interface more with the legal literature. And I feel like I have no legal training. So I, it's, I'm like very, very hesitant to do so. But I should definitely look into that angle. Thank you. Yeah, you got yeah, I'm just curious, like how many features do you have for like both the black box policy and the comprehensible policy? Like how many features do you consider? Yeah, so both of them use the whole feature, use the whole data set of around like 100, I think 50 covariates. Yeah, I, I see. So I'm just curious because in general for these black box models, they tend to have larger advantage when their the feature space is larger or more complex, like high dimensional. Right? Yeah. So I guess like whether the firm should stay with the black box policy or move to a comprehensible policy also depends on like how many feature or how complex is the feature space that they're faced with. Yeah, definitely. So and I think if you go back, that. yeah, so if we go back to this comparison, right, like why is this gap so small? And I think it's because in this Arvin data set, if you think, if you look at the data itself, a lot of people are zeros, like they don't buy in the mm -hmm. past. So then conditional that they're not zeros, only a handful of customers who are kind of using or interfacing with the firm regularly. So the effective, like the, the, the effective amount of heterogeneity that's useful is, is actually very small. So using a simple sentence is gonna capture most of that very well, while using a black box is gonna kind of capture that, but very noisily. So the, so the reason the gap is small because there's the actual amount of, like the, the true targeting rule actually is very simple. But in cases where it's very complicated, like you mentioned, where the black box kind of learns something that's very, very complicated, then the gap should be bigger. And then the, this trade-off, I guess, will be a little bit more tricky. Yeah, and another related question, I think a lot of the black box targeting algorithms, their benefits actually comes from targeting based on contextual variables, like your app address, like what's the time of the day, day of the week, meal yeah. period, et cetera. Yeah, so I wonder, like, do you also consider those in your comprehensible policy? Yeah, so, yeah, as long as, so in my case, as long as you have type through data, you can use the comprehensible policy approach. So in your case, like if I have IP addresses, I can just group IP addresses in geographical regions and then use the comprehensible policy approach. Right, but in your ex experiment, you haven't tested like like non personalized features yet, right? Like those contextual features. No, 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 not, not yet. Here is that what insights do you have there? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so everything here is this tabular standard tabular data in the RFM setting. Yeah, thank you. So, so going back to this example, so here I have I'm comparing the black box policy, I think, uh, and also the comprehensible policy, and I'm asking the question like, does the firm stay with the black box or move to the comprehensible policy? So to think about this problem, let's go back to the GDPR penalty, right? This is 4% of global revenues or 20 million euros. So let's just take the latter penalty, I guess, in mind. And if we assume a 10% enforcement rate, then the expected GDPR penalty will be 20 million times 10%, which is around 2 million of penalties if I decide to stay with the black box. On the flip side, if you take a 10 million customer base and you have a cost of explanation of 22 cents from before, then if I stay with the black box, I incur 22 cents times 10 million or 2.2 uh, million dollars. Or if I move away from black box, then I incur 2.2 million dollars of lost profits in expectation. So the firm is effectively trading off between whether I want to move away from black box and incur the cost of explanation, or do I want to kind of stay with the black box and possibly incur the GDPR penalty? And we can do this comparison for two other data sets. So this is the durable goods data set that I showed you before. I can also do this for a retailer. This is my paper with Gunter and Sanjog, where the treatment of variable is a catalog mailing that's being sent to, to different people. And there the customer base is 1 million. And the difference between this, the, the three claw sentence and also the black box is 8 cents. So there the total cost of explanation is 80,000. On another example, where I have a food delivery platform, this is my, paper, my other paper with Sanjog. Here we have uh, the treatment variables, whether you get free delivery on your next order. There, the customer base is 30 million, and it's much bigger, and the cost and the cost of explanation is going to be 35 cents, which is also bigger than the other two. There, if you scale this up, the total cost of moving away from the black box would be 10.5 million. So basically, the firms are trading off between this $2 million expected penalty or this cost of explanation as they move away, if you decide to move away from the black box. And to kind of force everyone to comply, regulators can increase, I guess, the enforcement rate or the penalties for, I guess, miscompliance. Mis and what's interesting is that this is exactly what they did with the AI Act. So if you look at GDPR, it's 4% of global revenues and 20 million or 20 million euros, whatever is higher. And if you look at the AI Act, it's now 7% of global revenues or 35 million euros, whatever is higher is the penalty. So with this in mind, I'll just recap. I think uh, I'm just on time. Uh, I have the contributions here. I've offered you a framework to think about uh, handle, handling targeting with practical constraints, or I guess in Omen's case, like I can think of this as more of like, kind of like an algorithmic audit. I think that's a nice way to frame this. Thank you. 
And so there's three parts of this framework. So the first part is having an optimal black box learning policy. Here's going to be what we call in the policy deep neural net, which combines policy learning and deep neural nets. The second part is constructing the class of sentences, the targeting policies that are sentences themselves. And then we can talk about how we optimize over this by finding the profit maximizing comprehensible policy or the profit maximizing targeting sentence. So with the framework in mind, I can now quantify the economic impact from these right coexistence laws as I see how people move away from the black box towards something that's comprehensible and trade that off between the expected penalty if they stay with the black box. And this general framework is going to be adaptable to other constraints. So there's nothing stopping me from re replacing this constraint, this comprehensibility constraint, with something like a privacy or fairness constraint and running this framework again. So this is giving you kind of like a cost analysis of thinking about what is the loss of implementing this constraint onto my target policy. The side that I didn't study is the side for the benefits, right? So there's a lot of papers in the CB side that kind of looks at how do people like or dislike explanations for actual decisions and then future work and kind of kind of quantify what is the, I guess, the benefit of explanation to kind of finish this cost benefit analysis. And that's all I have. So I'm happy to talk more offline and thanks for uh, tuning in and thanks for the organizers for having me for BQMS.